Hey guys, today we're talking about state machines. They're everywhere and we need them. In fact, you could turn most of the electronics around your house and maybe some very predictable creature into state machines to some extent. In just a moment, I'll be showing two examples of this, followed by a implementation in Unity as always. The code can be found in the description down below. Actually, it's a, it's a link to the website, then you can download the code on the website. In our example, we'll see two state machine. One of them is the movement state machine. I've shown this one in the past, but it's quite complex and it's it's a heavy state machine. It's not something that is gonna help you learn initially. So what I've done is I've created a second state machine with rooms and every time you enter a different room, a different mechanic happens. So that's much simpler to look at and that's what we'll be doing in the implementation. Those state machine we're gonna be looking at today can be split in three different big components that we have to understand. First one is what I like to call the motor. So that's like the brain. It controls the whole logic behind something. For example, if you have a dog and you wanna create a AI for a dog, then you put that one script, the brain on top of the dog, and this one will take care of changing the state, will take care of ensuring that uh, the whole mechanic behind the state machine works. The second one is the state. So in which state is the dog right now? Is he sleeping? Is he playing? Is he eating? Is he being, uh, an asshole. And the third component is a switcher. How does the dog go from one state to another? It can be internal and also external. We'll see some example in a second. To explain my point, let's have a look at some state machine example. We will start with a battle, boss battle from World of Warcraft. The fight start with a dialogue that is quickly followed by a combat state. And then the switcher in this case is, is the boss below 50% HP. When we reach that point, he goes in the air, he then summons minions that you have to kill, and that moves us to the next phase, in which he goes back to the floor, and then there is another phase of ground combat. He transitioned out of it when he hits below 5% HP, like right, right now, and then he enters another dialogue phase. This is all part of the, the whole lore of this boss. Then he enters a final enrage combat phase, and then you have to defeat him for real, in which case he doesn't really die, he just uh, gives another dialogue and then once they're done talking, once he shouts his last few words, he then dies and then you can finally finish the battle. So you can't relate to the state machine, let's try another one. This one is obviously fake, but we'll give it a try anyway. Here you can find my dog, he's currently in a very bored state and the only thing that will make him switch his behavior is if he's hungry, he wants to poop or any other external uh, switcher that could happen. Like in this case, the door opens. And when the door opens, he switched to an alert state. Now it's good to know that every single behavior that dog could have would be his own state. For example, if he's playing, he has his own playing mechanic. If he's eating, he has his own eating mechanic. If he's barking at something, he has a target and he's barking at that target. So that, that logic is all defined into a single state, which is why it is so good to make state machines because you can isolate a certain behavior. So one quick note before we jump into how to actually create this, how to create a very simple state machine, I'd like to thank everybody who actually um, purchased the Udemy course. So the Udemy course that I have linked down there. And I also want to thank uh, even more people who have left uh, rating because that helps me out quite a lot, helps me out financially, and it also allows me to put a little bit more time on YouTube instead of going back and forth and doing a freelance contract. So once more, thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, let's go and start the implementation. All right, let's head right in the engine. We are in Unity right now. There is two different state machine running in this project. And also a quick note before we get started. If you'd like to get this project, you can easily get it from the website. Now let's have a look at how we can implement this state machine. We need three different components. As mentioned, we need one, a motor, two, states, different states, and three, a way to transition in between them. So I'll show you right here in the folder. First one is the room motor. It's just a simple object here on top of my room controller. I could call it room motor as well. Um, it's an empty game object. It has nothing on it and it's just, it's just sitting there, right? Has the room motor script on it. The second is the room state. So we have only one over here. That's the base state. That's the abstract class. More info on that very soon. And we have all the rest of the states over here. This is where the custom logic lies. And finally, we have the room switcher, which you see over here. Again, it's a C-sharp script. Um, this one could also be seen as some sort of custom script because there is multiple ways you could be going and changing the state. 
it could be a boss battle and uh, the room switcher or actually the state switcher in this case would be looking at the boss health continuously until say for example he reaches 50 percent hp and if he gets below that point then we enter a different state so the boss will change his movement will change his attack and behave in a different way so that's one way to switch things the way we do it over here for this very specific uh, state machine here as you can see here we have the five cubes these <laughs> they're they're stuck together so they're hard to see but we have a five collider and as we enter in these we also change the state so my room switcher in this case is a simple on trigger enter so when you enter this trigger we call motor dot change state with whatever state that we have on top of us right now so i'll give you an example if we are headed to the timer room then you'll see here on the room switcher i have a reference to my motor which is the object with the three script on it actually <laughs> which is the object that controls it all and then we also have the room state timer so that's my custom logic very specific to this room Okay, so we have all the elements that we need at this point to understand this. Let's dive into the code, very simple code. We have the room motor over here, so our motor element. If I remove everything that is not required for a normal state machine, this is what you could end up with. So all you really need is to update the active state. So technically, this is, <laughs> this is how it should be. You need to update the the active state so whatever state we're in right now let's make sure this one is updated and also we need to have a means to change the state and this should be always sitting on top of the motor now this update over here it's the only update with motor behavior that you're going to have throughout the whole state machine this is the only one that will be updated with unity for the sole purpose that um, all the other states that will need to have something done in the update will be in a update state over here so we're not calling the mono behavior update but instead we're calling the state update now you'll find that i've added additional line of code over here and uh, this is for two reasons first i want to have a state when i start the state machine i want to have a initial state so here i dragged and dropped my room state idle in which i do nothing so i make sure that's my initial state and i also hit construct because it's just good practice to always construct your state so here I have initial state and as you can see on my motor when I start the game when this motor starts I point toward the room state idle and now you'll find that under my room state idle that's my custom logic it's quite big <laughs> so um, we, we pretty much did everything uh, regarding the motor that's all we needed now let's head into the state logic for every single state we'll need to implement those three functions construct destruct and update state construct is when we enter the state destruct is when we leave it and this destruct is being called whether we were forced out of our state or not so it just happens anyway right so if we call change state this destruct will be happening no matter what and finally update is if you need to do anything in the update um, this is where you do it you do it in something called the update state and then on top of that, I do have a link towards my motor inside of my state because my state sometime will need to use a motor and it's something that all my state are using actually, except the idle one. So I believe that this field was needed in so many different states that I just decided to, uh, to put it in here. For example, you could have different piece of UI. You could have a state machine for the UI of your game, which is something that we do in the subway skater. So if you're interested in seeing that implementation, you can um, find a link to the Udemy course uh, down below, first link actually. But uh, yeah, so if, for example, if you were using a different UI for every single state, you could have a public game object with your piece of UI over here and uh, just make sure you assign it. And then in your construct, you could say set active is equal to true. And when you leave it, set active is equal to false. So all you would need now to trigger a piece of UI is just to drag and drop in this field over here. This kind of logic uh, can be fairly cool. Now do note that those fields are virtual. So if you would do something like that, so if you would do something um, like a piece of UI for every single one, you would have to override first, override the construct, and then make sure you call the base.construct to uh, keep the code that you had in here. For example, in the room state idle right now, 
um, the code for switching the UI would work simply because we're not overriding the construct. So when we call construct on room state idle, what really happened is that we call this one. But if we were to override it, like we will for the future one, we would have to make sure we call base.construct before we do anything else. So our piece of UI would show up. Okay, so we had a look at a single uh, room. Actually, we had a look at the abstract class, which is the base class in which, you know, we can't just drag and drop this in the project because it's abstract. We are going to have a look at the different ones. We will start with idle and we'll just have a look here on the right side. As you can see here, idle is just there to exist as a state. It doesn't do anything. So we already got that out of the way. Um, second, let's have a look at platform. Platform actually is only here to control a animator. And you'll see over here that we still have access to everything mono related because we do have mono behavior hidden be behind um, room state. So room state, mono behavior, and then room state platform is inherited by that. So we still have access to awake, start, update. It's just we don't want to use the update because it, it should be updated in different manner. But um, yeah, in here we create a private field. We assign it in the update. And when we enter, um, when we enter this state, so when we walk inside of that room, we set trigger to on, and when we leave, we set it to off. So when we enter the room, animation is turned on, and when we leave, it's turned off. So let's have a look how this works in the game. As I walk into, I don't know, what, oh, this one. When I walk into the room, the animation state machine stops, and when I exit, everything is stopped, so it goes back to this state. Now, do note that if I were to stay in here, the, the behavior is that it just goes down one pillar at a time slowly, but I can make this much faster if I just leave. By leaving, this state is completely reset, and as you can see here, you play around with that. So the sole purpose of this state is to control a animator, so on and off. Now, over here on this side, this is the building state. So let's have a look at what this one does. As you can see, the logic is a little bit more complex, but we'll go through it very, very fast. We keep a list of cubes, which are a game object, and every time we press on the mouse button, we send a raycast and we create a cube. We then store that cube inside of the list. And then when we leave the state, so whenever we exit to a different state, then what happens is that we destroy all the cube and we clear the list. So let's have a look at this logic. I'm clicking, left clicking, nothing happened. As I walk into this, now I can left click and it creates a bunch of cubes, as you can see. And the second that I exit, they disappear. Enter, I can click, and then I leave. And they just clear themselves up. So I could be creating pretty much anything I want, but the moment I leave to a different state, they are all gone. So this one, as you can see here, is just a whole new set of logic just sitting in this script and, and it's not tied to anything. It's just when you're in there, you can spawn cube and when once you're out, clears everything and you're back to normal. Next up over here is the timer. So let's boot up this timer. Here we have a couple more fields. We have a UI that is actually being um, spawned, not spawned, but is being set to active in the construct and it's also being set to inactive in the destruct. Also, as you can see over here, we move the player when we exit this room, actually when we exit this, um, this state, we actually move the player with a reference to the motor. So we move him back to vector 3.0. Um, what else? Over here in the update, every single second, we're going to be adding up the delta time and then once we reach a certain point, so above five seconds, then we are going to change the current state and put it in a state transition to. So let's have a look on the object itself first. So on the timer, we see over here that the timer duration is five seconds. So we're going to be waiting five seconds in there. It's going to change the UI every single frame. And once we're done with this, once we have a uh, five second span done, we're gonna be put under room state idle. So let's give this a try. As I enter here, you're gonna see at the top, five second, 
and then we're put back in here with a different state. As you can see, we exit this state. We exit the timer state simply because the uh, UI, the piece of UI we had is gone. And yeah, so this one behave on its own and will kick you out eventually. One thing to note is that this one also affects the player. And finally, the most complex one, the gravity one. The reason it's the most complex is because it is a state machine that actually affects another state machine. So here you'll see that our motor, we have a reference to our motor, and then this one has a reference to our player motor, which is another state machine in there. And in that player state machine, you'll see that it's um, a lot more complex because we're actually moving the player. So in this one, for example, we check for grounded, we check for inputs, we rotate the player. Okay, so, so many things happen in this one. It's, it's a state machine that's a little bit more complex and actually it inherits from something else called base motor. So let's have a look here. A lot more stuff, but what we're really interested in is where is my change state? Here it is. Okay, so change state with the base state, that is for movement. So we do have the same exact thing here. Um, we have the function called change state and this one will change you into a different movement state. So going back in the gravity, we are changing to state flying. And when we leave the state, we're put under walking, which means as I walk inside of this room, my player should have his state, his movement state changed to flying. And then once we leave that room, actually once we enter a different room, then we're put under walking. So let's give this a try. And as you can see, I can now control this the way I want. So I'm currently flying. And um, this behaved the exact same way as the custom logic we have to, for the room. So for example, if I look for my flying state, it's as simple as that. I have a process motion, which is the equivalent of update state over here. But in the movement state machine, instead of being called update state, it's being called process motion. And on top of that, I send the inputs that I need because for moving, every single frame I send over the, um, the keyboard input and also the mouse input. And then with this logic, I return a vector three in which this is how I should be moving this very specific frame. So as you can see, I can fly. And right now I'm still in the same state because I haven't changed. I'm still in the flying state. And that is because I need to enter a different room to be thrown in that state. So for example, right now I'm flying over the, um, the collider cubes, but if I go over here and I just go down, as I go down, you'll see that I'll stop flying at one point here, and I've entered this room. Oh, and I just fell. And that's pretty much it for the implementation of this state machine. If you'd like to know more about this, or if you'd like to see the complex movement state machine that is actually running this character character controller, you can find that on Git and also you can find that on the website. So I do invite you to check it out. And that wraps it up for the moment. So thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing if you are not because only 10% of the people are actually subscribed. So let's get that number up. I'd, um, I'd appreciate if we do that. Uh, also, new video coming every week and also occasional live stream. So you might want to be um, tuning in for that, asking questions and whatnot. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.